Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. I am Inma Borrella. I am a research scientist at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, and I'm part of the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management Program. So uh, I'm co-hosting this live event with Ms. Laura Alege. Uh, she's also a course lead at the MicroMasters. And today we are very fortunate to have with us a Dr. Mani Janakiram. He's a senior principal AI engineer of manufacturing supply chain operations at Intel Corporation. Welcome, Mani. Thank you, Inma. Good morning and good evening uh, to all. So uh, let's kick off the event with a fun poll just to break the ice. Uh, I'm going to launch it now. So we just want to know where, why you are here today. So while you fill out the poll, uh, Laura will explain the agenda for this session. Awesome, thank you, Inma, and welcome, Manny. We are super happy to have you today. Um, so for about the next 15 minutes, Manny will provide some context on digital transformation. He will share examples about the digitization of Intel supply chain, and will discuss how to evolve from automated to autonomous supply chains. Inma and I will ask some questions we have prepared, but we will make sure that the last 15 minutes will be saved for your questions. So please use the webinar Q&A feature to ask those questions and be sure you're logged in with a name. We will not answer any anonymous questions. We will also share some more um, polls during the event. So be prepared to participate on that. And I don't know how many answers do we have already, but maybe we can start by checking the poll results. So Inma, you shared them, thank you. Um, so most of you want to learn about digitalization of supply chain, that's awesome. And I also see that you want to improve your supply chain using digitalization, so that's great. Hopefully, um, you, we will get to cover all these topics if time permits, and I'm sure you'll get a lot of great insights from Dr. Manny's experience. Um, so with that in mind, Manny, are you ready to kick it off? Yes, I am ready. I'll go and uh, share my screen and we can get started, so. Okay, let me do this. So, Laura, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So as uh, Inma and Laura indicated, I'll be talking about uh, our journey in the automated supply chain to autonomous supply chain. It's a continuous journey. So if you are thinking that we are there already, no, we are not there. We are uh, one of the travelers among many. And uh, so I wanna just get started with where Intel and what Intel and how it is supporting this kind of uh, autonomous operations across the world. As all of you know, the entire world is becoming digital. And uh, primarily there are a lot of reasons why it is becoming digital, but we are also living in the era of COVID and uh, working from uh, home, you know, like uh, having uh, different uh, technologies, AR, VR, and the availability of data, it's all forcing us to get into faster into the digital world. And uh, as you all noticed, uh, you know, semiconductors are primarily providing the underlying technology for many of this uh, compute, connectivity, cloud computing, as well as the advent of uh, artificial intelligence has actually exponentially increased uh, uh, how data uh, can be leveraged. And uh, another thing that's happening also is uh, the digital data has been skyrocketing. And uh, we expect uh, that the connected devices would be in the 58 plus billion devices by 2025, connecting every person on earth. And uh, we are looking at Intel to power this growth. Another question that might come up is why this digital transformation is happening now or why it is having this exponential growth. Again, repeating what I said earlier, uh, the fusion of data with IoT and numerous other data collection, we can easily capture and collect unstructured data, not just its structured and big data, and also the memory being really, really affordable uh, thanks to Moore's law and with, uh, you know, like in-process memory capabilities and uh, also availability of uh, compute power, 
as well as uh, very good sound reasoning with the AI and machine learning algorithms. When you put them together, that is where we expect the magic is happening. And um, so I, I mentioned AI and uh, artificial intelligence is actually enabling quite a lot of this transformation. For some of you, you know, artificial intelligence might bring an image of a, like a movie like a transformer or a movie like going back, uh, you know, like it could be more like, a, uh, you know, like a few other uh, science fiction movies, but reality is AI is all around us. We are using it, we are leveraging it, and uh, we are probably developing it as well. And uh, the whole idea is there is a ton load of information out there and, um, you know, like how we sense it and how do we, you know, like harness the information to reason out of it. And then once we reason what we see and sense, then we take action. And uh, that's where, you know, like we have interaction with the systems and, you know, ecosystem around us. And also the ability of the AI doing all these things, imagine, as well as learning and then integrating it into its next action. That is where the AI is actually enabling us. And we hear a lot in the medical industry, in the technology industry, how AI, the cobots are really helping us. And this is where, you know, like it is not necessarily just a technology for the sake of technology, but it is en enabling improving uh, velocity, agility, which is critical for supply chain, increasing productivity, increasing resilience, reducing complexity and uh, you know, cost. Those are some of the things that we actually are benefiting out of AI. And uh, as I mentioned, how Intel you know, like is delivering this particular capability of value through the semiconductor solutions. Yeah, we, you know, as you probably know, uh, we are one of the largest uh, integrated device manufacturers in the world. There are very few left. And uh, then when you start looking at uh, Intel is you know, like a huge internal factory network uh, with a global internal factory network at scale manufacturing. We are also expanding and leveraging the foundries out there uh, to expand the use of third party foundry capacity because Intel where, you know, like is not necessarily manufacturing every chip, but will be willing to provide an integrated solution through external foundries. And uh, given to the current uh, challenges also with our aspiration to be a, you know, like a one-stop shop for everything, we're also opening up Intel Foundry. And uh, so we're building, we used to have presence in the Foundry, but uh, our uh, CEO, uh, Pat uh, Yeltsinger is really looking to expand what we call as the IDM 2.0 to expand our solution in the end. And for that supply chain is going to be very critical because supply chain, Intel supply chain is not necessarily looking internally to support internal factories, but we're gonna be looking at how do we support a foundry? How do we support the external manufacturing activity? So the complexity and the scale has gone up. And I just wanted to give a quick uh, feel for how big and how complex our supply chain is. When you look at it from a skew perspective, it is not necessarily uh, at any order compared to the Walmarts and the Amazons. But when you start looking at the complexity, the lead time, you know, for example, the construction of a, uh, a, a Intel fab would take uh, anywhere upwards of, you know, like a two years plus with the four to $6 billion investment. And uh, the equipment that we buy, you know, our CapEx will be in the order of uh, 10 to $15 billion. And our spends would be in the order of uh, 25, $30 billion. Uh, and when you start to look at, uh, uh, you know, like one equipment, for example, lithography tool would be like hundreds of millions of dollars. So imagine uh, the data that we need to harness to keep this equipment productive, keep our factory running, not to mention, you know, like ensuring uh, continuous supply to our uh, suppliers, uh, I'm sorry, our customers, as well as working with our 10,000 plus suppliers. Uh, so this is the scale at which we operate. We have worldwide presence. We have what's called as the wafer fab where we fabricate and put the transistors and then assemblies where we actually package them and test them and uh, get them to the warehouses. And uh, so this is a big operation all the way from foundries to customer. Uh, so uh, it's a long process, it's complicated and, uh, but we are enjoying it and we're taking it as a challenge. And when we start to look at what are the different things we can do within that challenging environment Supply chain, uh, particularly given the, you know, like uh, the situation that we ran into, risk mitigation, resilience matters. 
com mitigating complexity matters, enabling faster lead time matters, and then ensuring that uh, our supply chain is cost effective and agile matters as well. So in that a, a particular aspect of how we wanna make our supply chain smart and intelligent, the digitization and the AI, AI like are playing a key role. We have uh, several uh, data scientists, the subject matter experts, and uh, you know, several of the engineers and technicians working together to really address various aspects of supply chain. We look at supply chain as a hybrid function. It is not just uh, the sourcing function, procurement function, manufacturing, or logistics, or planning. It is a combination of all. So because it's you know in gang, right? If I pull one, something else get pushed. And so how do we ensure that what we do has a global optimization versus a local optimization? And having a better uh, understanding of what supply chain data is telling us, having a better visibility that we can actually act on and having an ability to predict what is gonna happen and ability to take advantage of what we have, what limitations we have, and plan accordingly, you know, like prescribe, you know, like almost like an optimization. And in, on top of it, learn from what we do is what uh, the whole effort is. What I've listed here is a laundry list of things that we have implemented, working on, uh, and primarily I have kind of boxed some of those capabilities because these are, you know, like where, you know, like areas where we recently developed some uh, AI capabilities like supply chain end-to-end -end predictive visibility and leveraging IoT in combination with big data for actionable analytics. And we have uh, AI and ML models to uh, provide what's gonna happen, what's the best thing to do. And then in the contract analytics, which is hugely unstructured data, a lot of text, we have to develop a NLP models. We have to actually up, uh, streamline our process with RPA and uh, machine learning with clustering and looking at where and what, how the contract the terms are, you know, uh, working for us, how do we audit them so that we have, we don't have to, you know, like swift through thousands and thousands of contracts, but we need actionable uh, insight into what is happening in the contracts. And then inventory is a big deal for us. So we have to manage and make sure that we have the necessary inventory of uh, our products and spares and components at any given time. And uh, so we also develop self-serve inventory models because one inventory model is not gonna cut it. Maybe we have a multi-echelon inventory optimization. We have a primarily a, a you know a, a dyadatch based inventory. So we have different types of inventory model that gets kicked in. And uh, so we are optimizing spares uh, demand supply using data science as well. And uh, then of course, another critical aspect for us is uh, managing our ecosystem or understanding what is going on with our supplier uh, so that we can uh, proactively manage risk and keep our supply chain resilient. And so we leverage the cognitive, you know, web scraping and uh, leveraging all the data to really understand what is going on. Is there is, you know, issue with the supplier financial? Is there an issue with our, uh, you know, like with the COVID and everything? Uh, is the safety issues? If something hap is happening at one part, remote part of the world, uh, what is the impact to our customers? What is the impact to our supply chain? Impact to our employees? And, and also to the society so that Intel as a corporate citizen can uh, step up and uh, help. So these are some of the things that uh, we are you know, like looking at. And uh, you might be wondering, so where exactly are we heading with all these things? Uh, our goal uh, you know, like is to really go from a, a, uh, like a manual to automated to autonomous uh, supply chain. If you're wondering, what do you mean by that? I just had some you know, cartoons to just show that, hey, you know what? What I mean by manual automated autonomous is, for example, going from a broom to a vacuum cleaner to a Roomba, a Roomba kind of a, an autonomous uh, cleaning, or you know, most of your technology familiar that uh, I share this slide a lot. You know, you know, the way our navigation system has evolved from a paper map to, you know, to go from a place to a point A to point B to a Siri and navigation system that you just speak to it, you know, it primarily putting, uh, you know, like indicating where you want to go and uh, it directs you through traffic and takes you where you want to go. And of course, there are some stumbling blocks, but you know, like that's a, uh, that's a grow, growing uh, challenge that we have. And uh, what we are uh, facing, what we are looking is the uh, autonomous vehicles. And uh, in the future, I, I think it is there already in a limited way. 
uh, primarily the vehicle knows you, uh, it uh, knows your, it is in sync with your schedule, it connects and uh, you know, primarily it takes you to where you want to go without even blinking an eye. And uh, you probably, you know, like in the future will be sitting in the, you know, like in the passenger seat. Today you could, but I think there is little more infrastructure and things like that that need to happen. So now think of uh, the same technology that we can apply for supply chain. Currently, you know, like we, you know, we have planners, we have uh, um, uh, logistics uh, experts, we have uh, sourcing experts. So we tend to operate in silos. And uh, so as I was indicating earlier, going from a silo kind of thinking to connected, intelligent, what I call as the hybrid supply chain is where we should be looking at. And of course, there are you know, like challenges that like all of us have, you know, do we have the foundation ready? Do we have the data infrastructure? Do we have uh, uh, the right uh, kind of a governance in place? And uh, what are the you know, metrics that we want to manage? How do we you know, like make sure that culturally we are ready for this, uh, you know, like from a people and uh, from a business process and systems perspective? as well as what is the strategy to go from wherever we are to where we want to go and how do we go about it? It's not, you know, like close your eyes and you're there kind of a deal. And uh, foundationally, as well as operationally, what we want to do. And then leveraging, you know, like it's not the technology for the sake of technology, where and how we apply the advanced analytics and AI is also critical. So that those are the kind of things we're looking for, but uh, we expect the value out of this is going to be pretty big and uh, increasing customer, uh, you know, like obsession for, from our perspective to deliver the best value and uh, driving execution, uh, deliver to our commitments. Those are all the critical things we're looking for. So with that, I'm going to pause. And uh, this is uh, last, my last slide. So primarily, you know, like uh, as our uh, past uh, Andy Grow, our CEO used to say, you know, like uh, we are going through crisis, but don't let the crisis drive you you take charge of the crisis and survive it and then improve upon it is how we are looking at it. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and then we'll go back to Inma and uh, Laura. Thank you, Mani. I love that motto from your CEO, super inspiring. So thanks for a great introduction to supply chain digital transformation, supply chain digitalization, and for sharing interesting initiatives that Intel is implemented to actually achieve like this smarter, more efficient supply chain through by using digital tools. So um, now we will, we want to dive into some questions because this is a great appetizer, but we really want to keep talking about, about this topic. And you know, we know you're an expert, you've been at Intel for more than 20 years, mainly working on leading the digital transformation of the manufacturing and supply chain areas. So um, we would love to see, uh, to listen to, um, what you can tell us that how digital supply chain landscape has evolved during this, all these years and uh, where do you see it going? Absolutely. I, I think that, you know, like if you look at the evolution of digital supply chain, uh, even 30, 40 years ago, we had, uh, for example, a robot, a pick and a place robot was supposed to be a big deal at that time. Fixed locations, X, Y, and uh, Z, and then programming it using, I remember doing that with some of the robots just primarily being very happy building one uh, which was able to pick and place. But today the robots uh, are, you know, like, in fact, I was seeing the Boston Dynamics, it can actually dance to the tune, it can uh, jump, it can move, it can think. So the technology has evolved significantly. And it is not just for fun, right? I mean, it is also, we also hear about uh, uh, primarily having uh, AI engine uh, in uh, transactions in uh, you know, stock market, having an advisor kind of a deal and then AI admins. So what it is, as I indicated, uh, it is evolving. Within the semiconductor, within the supply chain, we see that our warehouses have, uh, I think in my, Laura, you can probably go into a lot of details there, but our, you know, like using uh, uh, robots, uh, location analytics and uh, things like that have improved significantly. So I, I think where it's going is really uh, going from uh, you know, helping uh, an assist to uh, you know, like taking and helping out the mundane task. Like, you know, I'm talking about doing the software, like for example, and look at RPAs, robotic process automation, robotic desktop automation. If what used to be an Excel macro many years ago, yes, you evolved into a huge uh, 
industry and software with an RPA. And where I see RPA is going is primarily, you know, if you kind of look at it from a Lean Six Sigma perspective, we talk about, hey, you have to look at a business process. You have to simplify it first so that you don't go automate something that is stupid. And then once you simplify, then you have to really look at, is there an opportunity for me to standardize things? Because that way it is easier for machines to learn, for people to, you know, like uh, adapt and things like that, right? So, so my uh, goal is simplify, automate, uh, and then autonomate. And uh, in somewhere in between, you have to make it intelligent. So simplify, standardize, automate, make it intelligent and autonomate. And this is where the digitization is going. If you look at RPA, RPA fits in there. If you look at digital transformation and AI, it fits in there. And then where it's going is also like a more like a digital twin, which probably is an ultimate transformation of where, you know, like our business processes as industry, you know, like visit asset twin or a process twin. So some of those things are happening in that fashion. And you made a very relevant point, Mani, that I would just like to highlight about this idea of do not just go and digitize your process, just think about the process, things you can simplify it, make it better, and then you go and standardize and digitize it. Don't just digitize whatever you have now, because that's not the way to go. So that's a, a very important previous step to digitalization that not many people think about when they start the digital transformation journey. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your answer, Laura. I think you have yeah. A, a, yeah, so something let's for go the audience. Now, let's go now for launching the second poll, Inma. And the idea now is to bring you some information about Intel. So we are doing uh, an Intel trivia, which is a, uh, one of fun facts. And we want to learn what you know about Intel. Uh, so you will have something there on selling watches, owning a museum, or some Guinness record out there. Um, and while we gather some of your responses, I would like to go back to many. Um, so we have seen all the disruptions of this past year, and I would say a little bit more than that. And those have been pushing forward innovation. And I think this is related with what you mentioned on trying to survive and also trying to improve uh, as your CEO mentioned. And I was wondering if you could tell us how Intel um, was affected by the disruptions of the 2020 and how having a digital supply chain may have helped you on that period. Absolutely, the disruption that we lived through or living through is uh, something that I don't think anybody expected the scale or uh, the impact, but uh, we had, you know, like uh, to your question, uh, our supply chain, uh, we, we have uh, primarily business continuity planning in place. In fact, we have a risk and resilient team that you know, like we, we kind of do some of this, not necessarily like COVID-like kind of an exercise. We, we do natural disaster. What happens, like for example, some of the currency issues, or you know, we are also going through some of the cybersecurity issues and uh, so things like that, right? So we have uh, business practices in place, and the business practices were actually uh, helped with the digital activity in the sense that we could actually leverage modeling and we could uh, leverage some of the, uh, uh, you know, like a business process models and data and uh, projection and prediction to say that, and like a decision tree, for example, right? You know, in simple terms that we could leverage to see what happens if you do this and what would be the end result look like, the scenario planning and how do we, you know, what would be the best answer for this one? So does this mean, do we have to plan our inventory differently? Does it mean we have to respond differently? And do we have to look at, um, you know, like alternate sourcing for that? Do we have to really look at with the warehouse and the cost of transportation going, these uh, longer lead, you know, like contracts need to be in place versus, you know, a fixed versus variable. So those are all the things from a supply chain perspective, we look at it. And uh, also when we had this COVID situation, we were really looking at what are the different uh, products? How do we respond to customer? How do we make sure that our suppliers not just from product uh, delivery perspective, but also from overall health, they're good. We also got into you know, providing them with, you know, like with masks and ventilators and ensuring the health of our employees as well as our suppliers was you know, like, uh, taken care of from that point of view. Awesome, thank you, Manny. And uh, it's, it's amazing to see, okay, we had the disruption caused by COVID, but how are we preparing and culturally also to have the strict and resilient team and to be ready to address any kind of disruption. So it has been a great push of growth and 
now I think we're ready to do much more in the future. So thank you for your insights on that. Okay, so um, let's take a look at the poll. Um, most people, I don't know, many of you know the answers, the right answer to the <laughs> poll. Uh, some, yeah, Intel insights, but um, most people answer that Intel's first processor powered a calculator. 51% of people believe this is the one that is true and, that, and that's true, so you're all right. But actually this was a trick question and all the options were right. So Intel also used to sell watches. Intel has its own museum in California. It wasn't the company's original name, even though we, we all know Intel as Intel forever. Uh, and also in 2018, Intel set a new Guinness World Record title for most drones flown simultaneously. I, I need to find out YouTube video for that because it must be amazing. Um, so now you know a little bit more about Intel Corporation. Let's continue with our discussion. Mani, did you know all these facts? Fun facts? Um, you know, like I had to look up the last <laughs> part. I, I knew that, but I had to look up. I'm being honest here, but uh, everything else, yeah. And I think uh, if you are in uh, Santa Clara, I would strongly suggest that you go to visit our Robert Nice building. The museum is exceptional, so. Awesome. We'll do next time we travel to California. So um, digitalization is a very fussy term and digital transformation and the digital transformation discussion is full of technology buzzwords. So we hear IoT, blockchain, digital twins, cobots, and many people don't really know how this applies to supply chain management. So um, I really think that at the end of the day, digital transformation is about improving supply chain processes by using digital tools, but the focus should always be on the supply chain processes and not just on the technology itself. So um, some of our audience, members of our audience are currently taking a C1X in which we cover the basic uh, pillars of any supply chain that's forecasting inventory management and transportation. So. Um, could you tell us how digitalization has improved specific supply chain functions, such as forecasting inventory or transportation at Intel? Absolutely. Uh, let's take forecasting. You know, we all know that uh, uh, the famous uh, uh, statistician, uh, George Box said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that what it means is you can have the best forecasting model out there, but if a situation arises, it's going to you know, the demand volatility, uh, the supply volatility might put you in, what did I forecast really? And as you also know, as uh, if you're forecasting within the uh, first quarter, you know, like within a year, your uh, demand, um, you know, like a forecast uh, error, it would be smaller. But as you project further out, it is like an outward funnel. So what, what it means is you have to really leverage uh, the power of people, data analytics to really uh, uh, to come up with what the data is telling us around us and then how often do I need to go make adjustment to it and then try out different scenarios. Some of the techniques you know like it you know like a, a pro and uh, time series models we of course leverage sometimes it is not just the one algorithm or one uh, you know analytic model that we're going to go with we look at an ensemble. We need to learn from what has happened in the past. And we also know that uh, some of the changes that happen, either it's a, you know like a trending or a drifting, we know we can capture it. But if it is a huge step function, what uh, Clayton Christensen calls as a you know disruptive uh, change, that is sometimes hard to capture. But if you were to look at it, so, you know like in a cycle, you know like cyclical fashion in semiconductor, for example, in the past we know the you know the CAGR or the compound annual growth rate is around you know 68 percent. And then every, uh, you know, like every six years, there's a huge, uh, you know, like a shift and a swing because that is the lead time for building factories and putting capacities. So you could actually start to think about how it is going to change, not to mention how the technology is changing, what the adoption rate is. And of course, last year, as you noticed, there was a lot of semiconductor, short, you know, semiconductor shortage. It is not necessarily because of the growth. It is also because of some of the uh, supply shortages that uh, culminated and also some, uh, you know, like a mad rush for some of the products thinking that it may not be available, uh, you know, like I want it now. That there was an explanation for it because you're working from home, you need more compute power, more PC, you want more uh, bandwidth. 
things like that that has uh, changed what people are looking for. So from our perspective, we leverage uh, forecasting models. We leverage different scenario models. We have uh, inventory optimization model. On top of it, if you're you know, like having a new product, we have a, uh, at least a digital twin, twin kind of starts with a simulation, if you will, right? Modeling of what's gonna happen, how it's gonna happen. It could be a simple, you know, like a Monte Carlo model. It can go into a more sophisticated discrete event simulation model to really understand how my network looks like. What are the different echelons in my network that is going to be constraints? How do I manage my inventory buckets across the board? What are the metrics that I need to really understand? And then what, once you have that kind of a model from a uh, optimization perspective, you can align capacity and demand through, uh, you know, like a big optimization engine that we leverage. And uh, so it could be a linear programming. And we also couple that with uh, machine learning to explain what the optimization engine is telling us so that we could, uh, we could do not only predictive scenarios, we can also explain the decisions we're making. And uh, we are also leveraging uh, within our models, within our business processes, RPAs to automate, to understand data, to synthesize and uh, ensure that it is, you know, like uh, it is right, it is governed right, it has got the right metadata. So it's a combination of all those things in that we are leveraging. And we are looking at the metrics like um, safety stock and we're looking at service level, you know, like what's the service level you're improving and uh, satisfaction rates. We are looking at inventory points, and of course, we are also modeling cost, and uh, you know, from a strategic point of view. I think it's uh, really interesting the way you just bring it down to earth with with the specific examples. I think that's much needed when we talk about digitalization, um, and all this idea of uh, using these new technologies to really augment the capabilities that that we have. So really, like having better optimization models in which you can get better insights into machine learning or um, just using RPAs to optimize the, the management of data. It's really um, like a very interesting way of just expanding the, the amount of things and the, and the insights that you can get from the data. So thank you, Mani. Thank you, Mani. So in your presentation and moving forward uh, to the next question, you talk about the transition from automated to autonomous supply chain that is what's bringing everyone today here with us. And this transition, of course, will have important strategical and operational implications for Intel. So we would like to ask you, why is this a key strategic pillar for Intel? And how is the company working on it? But we would like to know about the change man management perspective. We're thinking on how to ensure the adoption, how to reduce the anxiety of your team, how to reskill the workforce. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, it, you know, like just because we are automating, our, you know, like going for the autonomous goal, it does not necessarily mean that it is going to impact uh, people. There will be some impact in terms of skills and uh, ability to move up in the, uh, you know, like in, in the learning and things like that. And that is where, you know, like as I indicated earlier, the transformation, technically we have the pieces together that we can make it happen. Culturally, you know, like I'm you know, broadly speaking, culturally and strategically, we have ways to go uh, to the extent of this is my data, this is my process, this is how I do it. Or uh, the moniker that I'm a planner and I'm attached to planning versus, okay, you know, you do the best planning and if you're not able to deliver the product, what good is there, right? So thinking holistically versus, uh, you know, like in silo, that is a cultural shift as well. Having the right, uh, right leadership to support because this is not gonna happen overnight. This is, a, 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 this is an effort that is a long-term effort that need to be supported. And luckily we have that kind of a support within Intel, as you might have noticed that we have been, uh, a, you know, like the top 10 supply chain leaders as recognized by Gartner over the 10 plus years. And uh, those are the, you know, like the reason why they're looking at is number one is the supply chain customer enabling and supporting. Is it uh, ability to uh, adapt technology and be agile and leverage the technology for the sake of solving problems and enhancing the supply chain. So those are the kind of things we are looking at it. And this also is from a sustain you know, like sustainability and a good corporate citizenship perspective, right? We, for example, we have systems and tools that monitor and understand our uh, water usage. And we have 90 plus percent uh, recycling. And our goal is to be 100%. 
And uh, then we also have alternate energy. In fact, we have uh, the solar farms, uh, most of our parking lots to leverage and to harness energy from that. It is just a name a few. And then we all, all of you are very familiar with the complex free mineral initiative. And uh, so zero waste uh, is not necessarily something uh, you know, like that, is, that has happened, but it's happening as we go. And so those are all the things that we can, you know, with the power of data, with the power of analytics, we are understanding what is going on. We plan for what can happen and then look at, uh, you know, visually understand and predictively manage these things. Thank you, Manny. Uh, I think it's uh, super interesting to speak about the company culture and the cultural change that it's required, and the fact that the top management should be super committed to it, so that the full company is into that. So that's a great addition above everything that we usually teach that is a little bit more technical sometimes. So it's great to learn about that part of the strategy. And I also think you have answered some of our learners and in audience questions because they are super interested in the application of sustainability. So thank you for bringing those examples. Great. Yeah, I know Intel is doing a lot in the sustainability space, also upstream with, with their suppliers and all these initiatives. So using um, this sourcing intelligence just to have a better Sourcing visibility. intelligence, uh, inclusion and diversity initiatives. And, uh, you know, we're spending uh, billions of dollars uh, where, you know, like a my, uh, sub minority suppliers and things of that nature, you know, improving the diversity. So there are a lot of efforts in that space as well. You know, you got it. Sounds great. Yeah, we should have a live event about that another day. So, um, most of our participants today are supply chain professionals, and they may be looking to involve themselves in the digital transformation of their own supply chains. So this may seem as a daunting task for many companies that are starting or have not even started this journey. So what advice can you give them? Uh, where should they start or how should they start thinking about it? Absolutely. I think uh, some people, you know, like in my initial career, I was very fascinated by technology. Like, oh, this robot, it's beautiful, it works, it picks up things in places. So I was more focused around how can I make this technology to work? I think the thinking should always be, what is the problem that needs a solution? The solution need not have to be uh, you know, high tech. It needs to solve the problem. But if the problem is repeating and if you're solving it you know, like on a regular basis, then you need to think about is there a better incremental approach to it? And then, you know, like once you have the credibility and the ability to solve this kind of things and things are going well, then you need to start thinking about, can I do something disruptive? Because the solutions that we have incrementally will give you value, but something that is disruptive uh, would take you way forward. I'm talking about some of the technologies that have transformed for example, the way, you know, like we watch videos, streaming videos, never thought of it. We talked about some of the, uh, you know, like the map uh, to digital transformation. Those are to me, you know, like uh, big uh, disruptive technologies. In supply chain, you may be thinking about what are the different things we could do incrementally, I'm adding value and developing credibility. And then, you know, a long term, I'm looking at disruptive technology that built on my credibility, I can go make it happen. And I also understand that this is something that I cannot go from zero to one. That means I got to make sure that I have the right, uh, you know, like adaptive, you know, like a mentality folks working with me. I have models that shows what it can happen. Like for example, if I have to uh, go make some big changes on a, a 50, $100 million kind of tool, I could, well, some of the things I could do is work with suppliers, you know, do, do design of experiment, develop some of those things, actually run the physical product. I imagine if you have an asset twin that actually uh, mimics your physical model and people trust what you're doing that, you know what, if you change this particular location of uh, um, the particular uh, thermal processor, you could reduce the time by 10%, for example, that if you were to model it in an asset twin and show that that is how it is gonna happen without impacting quality, then you can actually disruptively go from what would have taken physically months to maybe, you know, like, days to weeks. So those are the ways you, you know, make sure that you understand where the big problems are, prioritize the problem, get uh, the buy-in from uh, not just the leaders, but also from your community, because, you know, like uh, adapting and leading and people willing to try it out, your peers are also is critical. 
and then experiment and um, you know and then go from there is how i would look at it awesome thank you mani i couldn't put it in better words than you so i'll leave it there and uh, i think we can go to our audience's questions now right laura yeah we should run our last poll maybe before we go to the q a so we let it pre-populate uh while we speak um so our last poll it's about what you've learned from today's uh event we would really like to know if we'll fulfill your expectations or if you're going home with something else that you expected and then meanwhile um let's go to the q a um I don't know if in my few have one already. I, I can start. So, um, so we have one question about, of course, shortage of semiconductors because it's been in the news for so long. Uh, so it's a very no, well-known topic that COVID-19 impacted. So could you elaborate how Intel used digital elements or digital tools, I guess, specifically planning visibility and autonomous inventory management in mitigating these impacts. So I guess expanding a little bit more of what you already already shared. I, I, I think, you know, uh, making data visible uh, in a real time is something of high value for us because things are changing on the fly. And how do we act on it? What are the different things we can do? That is where having the power of data uh, digitization and analytics is helpful and then understanding and playing out different scenarios, the inventory positioning, do we want to push, do we want to pull? Those are some of the things we are leveraging. And also having a war room of sorts, and then you know having the right people come in and look at this data, look at it from uh, overall, uh, what the impact of the customer uh, and uh, suppliers and our factory and employees in a wholesome fashion is where the data analytics came together, what actions we can take is something that we were able to leverage. And then what are the mitigations that we can do and how do we communicate it? And things of that nature were very helpful and useful tools, whether it is an optimization, whether it is a prediction models, whether it is a control tower with, uh, you know, like data visualization, leveraging them or, you know, sourcing intelligence that would come in and tell us, this is what happened here, this is what we need to do. Things of that nature we're all putting together. And then of course, from a logistics perspective, what are the, uh, you know, like we hear about the ports and situations, uh, you know, like getting the, our products getting stagnated, the supplier not able to ship, how are the things, what is the contract, how, you know, like, do we have the right things in place? All those things need to be looked at in combination to look at how do we ensure uh, uninterrupted uh, delivery. Thank you, Mani. So just going back to the poll and sharing some of our uh, audience comments. So expanding my knowledge on digital transformation is the most interesting part uh, of today's event. And also understanding the impact of digitalization in supply chain function. Um, of course, getting ideas about improving supply chains, learning about automation and autonomous systems and the difference. So thank you for bringing all that to our audience. I would like to add one question. So. I think, oh, sorry, Laura, just yeah. mentioning that just people just selected almost all the options in this poll. So that means that money covered almost all the expectations from everyone. So that, that's that's great. Uh, I think it was uh, a very complete discussion and, and the presentation. Go ahead, totally. Laura. Totally, totally. So thank you, Mani, for that. Um, so some of our uh, audience is asking of, about um, we know digitalization, and you also mentioned a lot of possibilities on how to apply digital transformation or the different tools that there exist. And they say, well, we can apply it to almost every aspect of a supply chain. We want to know where is Intel prioritizing that implementation. Do you have any comment on that? That's a great question. Uh, primarily, you know, like our priority starts with the customer obsession. Uh, meaning uh, what does what are the critical aspects the customer want? So understanding uh, customer needs are changes in priorities and how do we go from there from a product to planning to capacity management is where we start with. So we have uh, you know SNOP and SNOE processes that we are prioritizing heavily and uh, we are leveraging the power of data analytics and modeling in that space. 
And then from that point onwards, we're also looking at what it means to expand our capacity. That's where the IDM 2.0 comes in. Our customers not only are asking for just the Intel CPU product or uh, server products, they're also asking for expanding the product horizon. That's where we are moving into the external uh, manufacturing, um, as well as how do we support the Inbus earlier question, semiconductor, uh, you know, like being uh, shortage and everything. What are the different areas we can help uh, the industry, our customers, as well as our government through the foundries is another area we are prioritizing. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of planning that is gonna happen. And uh, there's a lot of focus around construction. Uh, we are, we're gonna be spending you know, like 20 plus billion dollars this year, uh, just in US, and then we have expansion plans there. So the supply chain is very central to how we do that expansion. How do we support, what are the SNOPs? So those are the critical areas we're looking at right now. Another question from Lim Bryan said, hi Manny, I noticed that you mentioned several times the culture change needed when, transform, when transforming to the next level of supply chains. Uh, so what exact culture change are you referring to? Uh, there are a couple, but one thing that comes to my mind right now is uh, ability to let go is, you know, like you, you should not think that I control things in supply chain. And if you were to think that I am part of the supply chain and I can play a role, significant role in controlling, I would like to leverage everything, you know, like uh, around me to make our supply chain better. That to me is a big change. You know, like if you were sitting on a data, if you are managing a particular function and if somebody were to come and say that a technology can make that happen for you. For example, if someone, uh, a commodity manager is pulling a supplier risk data and I have a, a ecosystem sensing tool that actually does the web scraping and comes and provides similar plus enhanced information uh, if the commodity manager is not willing to adopt that, then that's going to be a stumbling block. So to me, you know, like willing to let go and willing to embrace uh, the, you know, like technology and the solution around you to enhance the supply chain would be a big cultural change. Willing to let go for operations people is, <laughs> is a tough one. So I love that. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. Trusting more like technology and, and what they can it can bring just uh, just to contribute to to moving the supply chain forward. Great advice, um, thank thanks, Mani. Thank you, Mani. So um, we have time for a couple more questions, maybe. So Remy is asking about how's the criteria, how to select the criteria to measure the level of automation that you have on a supply chain if that exists and how would you evaluate your progress on the implementation of automation? Great question again, because there are always computing priorities. There are always, uh, all, you know, like uh, multiple more projects than you can handle. So it comes down to, you know, like for us, we really look at what are the critical challenges, you know, Intel supply chain has. We have what's called as the strategic initiatives. We have, uh, uh, you know, Primarily, we have targets in terms of uh, customer, uh, product, uh, you know, like a capacity, supply chain. We have the metrics, right? Looking at agility improvement, looking at cost improvement, looking at, uh, you know, so, so those targets, we look at how do we go about doing that? And then in supply chain, what are the things we can support? And what are the, you know, like big challenges uh, that, uh, that are pain points for us? So that's our starting point. And then we look at strategically, what are the targets that we want to go accomplish? It not necessarily have to be pain points, but some of the technology changes that, okay, now I need to bring digitization in the SNOP process. But the question is, it is not the technology for the sake of technology. It is, a, you know, what solution am I solving? What metrics is it going to move? And is that movement going to be significant enough that I can actually get a buy-in from, uh, you know, all the decision makers? So that is, we have a chartering document, we have uh, you know, like a management review committees, and uh, we kind of want to go fast, but we also want to go make sure that we have the right areas where we want to go fast. So we use that kind of a governance model to leverage and uh, you know, like fund uh, the various projects. And then we have good program management uh, uh, tools to monitor and then milestones. 
And then we actually, once we develop and implement, we also monitor the progress and the value or the impact. And uh, before we start another project, if it is connected, we look at what did the value from there brought in? And we also have center of excellences where we leverage the resources as well as the learning to look at, did we uh, deliver what we delivered? And in fact, we also do something like, okay, imagine that uh, I'm funding you today, six months from now, uh, you know, whatever the timeline is, how do you see changes happening? What are the metrics that are gonna move? And then we go back after six months and see, this is what we said is gonna happen. This is where we are. It's not that always we hit the target like the way we said, because our eyes are sometimes bigger than our appetite, right? So, but we at least wanna make sure that what, what the variances are and how we can adjust and move forward. Awesome, thank you, Mani. I truly believe that's a, a great advice and a recommendation for uh, our audience. And the fact that we understand where we are before we know where uh, we are going to go and also how to connect what we do to the impact it will make. I think it's a great advice. So thank you for that. I think we can answer one more question before we wrap up. So Carmel to, uh, uh, just says, hi Mani, thank you for sharing your insights. May I know at which point an area are human intervention required in an autonomous supply chain? This is a, a discussion that is ongoing, right? Like where this all human machine interaction, when is the human input needed in an increasingly autonomous system? I don't know where are your, your, your ideas on that. I, I think uh, if the question is uh, trying to ask, uh, are we going to reach a singularity point? Uh, my perspective is probably we're not, not at least in the, you know, like in some, in some areas, like for example, managing inventory, like if you have thousands of SKUs, uh, hundreds of thousands of SKUs, and would you be looking at reorder point and safety stock for all those components and SKUs? Probably not. Then you're going to have a prioritization and then others, you're going to have some kind of a model and a math that says, you know, when you hit 80%, I mean, I'm just giving an example, right? Mm -hmm. Trigger in a reorder point, for example. So those kind of things that uh, are not necessarily, at the same time, if you're buying a $100 million tool, you're not going to let a automation, uh, an, an autonomous uh, system takes over. You will have some kind of a it becomes more like a decision support. It is not decision making kind of a tool. So that means you really need to understand what your supply chain wants, what your priorities are, and where you need to make sure that the human uh, uh, like decision is required and where you don't have to. Uh, so that it, it kind of comes down to the metrics that they're gonna uh, drive by and, uh, and also uh, the governance model they're gonna put together. But short answer is, I don't see a complete autonomous supply chain happening in the near future. Thank you, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be a, a tough one. It would be nice to have like more, more autonomous parts of the supply chain for certain products as key use, as you mentioned. But uh, yeah, it's gonna take time. Still, it's a very interesting debate, right? Where the human input is gonna be required even when you have like AI expanding its influence in, in our decision making. Yeah, they're so making that, your life a lot more easier because when you look at it, that complexity is expanding and the data and uh, the decision making, you know, like data is explore, you know, like basically it is going at an exponential growth and the decisions need to be made now, not later. So at some point it becomes harder when you have to decide on thousands and you know tens of thousands of variables to come up with the right answer, it becomes beyond human comprehension. So that's where a level, you know, like leveraging data analytics and uh, the power of AI will come into big play. And it is happening already. Yeah. Great. So thank you so much, Mani. I think this is a, a great uh, like last uh, discussion just to, to wrap up the, the event. We uh, really enjoyed your presentation, your insights around supply chain digitalization. This is such a hot topic right now and such a complex uh, area to go into. I'm sure our, our audience has appreciated your insights and your, your suggestions and your advice on how to think about it. And uh, hopefully we'll see many more companies starting this journey um, and maybe being inspired by what Intel has been doing in this 
past decade. So thank you so much, Manny, for being our guest once again in the MicroMasters. We, we really enjoy our discussions with you every time you join our live events. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you again in, in the future. Great. Uh, thank you, Inma and Laura, for the opportunity. And hopefully the audience enjoyed it as well. Thank you.